We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. My name's Matt, by the way. If we haven't had a chance to meet, uh, I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor and one of my favorite parts of this job is on most Sundays, I'm asked to, to stand up on this stage and to open up God's Word and to teach truth out of it to you. And I want you to know that when we open up this book and, and I am praying that God speaks truth out of my mouth, uh, not just to you, but also to me. It's amazing how God teaches me every Sunday when I teach. And so I want to invite you to grab a copy of God's Word. We're going to do something a little different this morning. Uh, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture, but I'm not going to put it up on the screen and make it easy for you. So grab a copy of God's Word and open up to John chapter 6. If you don't own a Bible, you can uh, grab the Bible from the chair in front of you. And on that, uh, to make it easy for you, page 641 is where you're going to find John chapter 6. And by the way, you can just write your name on that Bible and take it with you if you need a Bible. We want you to have one, okay? Um, So John chapter 6, I'm going to read... Uh, the f- first uh, 15 verses together, and then we're going to pray. Here's what it says uh, in the NLT version. It says, After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. So last week, Pastor Michael was talking about uh, Jesus and his, his healing miracles, right? We got to see in a couple examples where Jesus was able to heal sick people. Well, now we see the result of him healing sick people as people saw him healing sick people and now they're following him wherever he goes, right? It says, verse uh, three, it says, then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There is a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this uh, miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Let's pray together. Father, right now I ask that you would allow your word to to continue to come alive to us, that we would be able to see clearly out of it what it is that you want each of us to see. It might be something different for every person in this room, Father, but I pray that you would allow your word, which we know is alive, uh, to to speak to us and that each one of us would be able to walk away today more like your son. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So church, uh, this is clearly a miracle Right, you see Jesus show up, and 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 there's these. It says there's five thousand men, uh, so that's not even telling you how many women and children were also there. We're we're going to assume that there's probably about fifteen thousand people gathered together, 
And, and, and Jesus shows up, and they're following him because of all of his healing miracles, and they're hungry, and Jesus takes five loaves of bread and two fish and is able to provide for their physical needs and feeds everybody until there's leftovers. Clearly, we can look at this and say, well, that's a miracle. It's a miracle. In fact, this is oh, the one miracle of Jesus that is mentioned in all four gospel accounts. There are other miracles of Jesus, plenty of them, but this is the only one that's mentioned in all four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about Jesus feeding this crowd of people. And you want to know why I think this one makes the list that, of the short list of one that makes all four gospels? I don't know about you, but it's the same reason that we go to Texas Roadhouse. It's the bread, right? It's this, that there's, there's this, some room, you sit down at a table and you eat and they bring you some fresh bread and then when that's gone, they ask you if you want more and you say yes and they bring you more and by the way, the little secret, you always want more because you can take it home with you people, right? And they're just gonna keep bringing you bread. I'm pretty sure that Jesus lives in that back bakery of Texas Roadhouse because the bread is just always there. It's just amazing, and so we have this, this example of Jesus taking bread and multiplying it. It's clearly a miracle. And so I was looking at this miracle and trying to think, well, what, what could like the sermon title be today? Like what could be the, the theme of how maybe God's asking me to preach this? And a lot of ideas come to mind. There's like 50 sermons in this one passage of scripture. But one of the ones that kind of came to mind uh, was the idea of, listen, when you eat with Jesus, there will always be leftovers. That would have been a great sermon, but I didn't go that route. I was thinking, well, I could also talk about how uh, Jesus is able to do a whole lot with the little that you can bring to the table. That would have been a great sermon, but I didn't go that route this morning either. I was thinking, well, you know what? I could just talk about Andrew. We had the, this example of Andrew. He's always bringing people to Jesus. He's bringing this little boy over to Jesus saying, hey, and we could say, hey, look at Andrew and the example. We should also always be bringing people to Jesus. That would be a great sermon, but I didn't go that route. So, and all the different routes I could go with this passage of scripture, what I want to do this morning is show you four things that we can learn about Jesus through this miracle. Four things that we might be able to, to better appreciate and understand about Jesus. What can we learn from this miracle of Jesus? The first thing I think that we can learn is this. This miracle shows Jesus' compassion. It shows his compassion. Now remember, this miracle exists in all four of the Gospels. So I want to read to you a passage out of Mark chapter 6. Mark, in chapter, his chapter 6, also shows you this story. And it gives you a different perspective. In verse 32, it gives us some context for how this miracle was about to go down. It says, So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. Just pause here for just a moment. You really understand, before Jesus performs this miracle, what's going on in the heart and mind of Jesus and his disciples? They know that everywhere they're going, the people keep going to them, and they're not able to rest. They're not able to be alone for a moment. So they get on a boat, and they decide, listen, if we go on a boat, 15,000 people can't get on a boat with us, so we can go and be alone and, and get to the other side and maybe have some time to ourselves. And, and as this is happening, it says, but many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Have you ever gotten to one of those moments where you're like, I just can't wait to get home and just relax for a moment. And the moment you get home, there's work waiting for you. You know what I'm talking about? This is like Jesus over and over again. He's, he's now going to where he can rest and be alone and get some time. And that the, the, these people that have seen him do these miraculous healings, they're actually running around on foot to the other side of the lake and they're there before Jesus gets there by boat. And it says, Jesus saw uh, the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had what? Compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. <laughs> you know, my, my sometimes default reaction in those moments where I'm looking for some downtime and work follows me is just frustration. Maybe I let it out on the people. Listen, no. 
but Jesus immediately sees people. Here's the deal. This, this compassion, they're, they're trying to catch this break. They can't catch one. And I don't know about you, but I, all of us, you, you know what it feels like when someone shows compassion to you. Do you guys like it when people show you compassion? It's a great thing, right? A recent example for me, just a couple, uh, last week, our, our pastors went to this little one-day conference, and a part of the conference was for two hours we got to divide with some other pastors from other churches and, and play a, a, a round at Top Golf. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's not really a round, but we got to drive some balls off, you know, whatever. And, we, and if you know anything about me, I'm terribly unathletic. Like, my hand-eye coordination is terrible. If you ever wanted or thought about, maybe I should invite Matt to go golfing with me. Listen, save yourself the headache. Don't. Don't do it. You'll just be miserable. And I'm sitting there thinking, all right, I'm supposed to now drive this ball off of this tee out there, and there's a bunch of people I don't really know all that well that are watching me do this, and this is about to be really embarrassing because I know what's going to happen when I swing. I'm going to swing, and the ball is still going to be sitting right there. I know it. And sure enough, that's like half of my swings. And there's one pastor who just, you know, compassion must be his thing. Because he's just like, yeah, you were so close that time. He's just like, like, I think I just did something amazing. And all I was, I was really close to hitting the ball off the tee. Well, every time I'd make some, I'd hit it and would just like roll off the edge. You're like, yeah, that's it. Like, show compassion. I loved it. We love it when people show us compassion. And you got to understand that what Jesus is, is showing us here, this word compassion, it, it, to us it just sounds like a feeling. It's just like, oh, Jesus took pity on them. See, this word means so much more than that. In the Greek, it's this word, um, I had to write it down because I don't really know Greek. It's spadzidjume. And, this, and, and I might not be saying it right, so you Greek scholars, you can correct me later. Spadzidjume, uh, it basically it's this compassion. It, it means to be moved from your inner parts. It says that Jesus cared so much about these people, they were in such desperate need. See, most of us, we don't like to admit when we're needing compassion. We don't like to admit when we're in need. We'd rather like stand on our own two feet and kind of get through our problem on our own. We don't want people to think that we're weak. So we kind of, these people show up and they have so, they're so much like sheep without a shepherd that it's just obvious that they are desperate for Jesus. And he looks at them and he shows this spadzidume, this compassion that simply means that, he, uh, that his, uh, what is it, to be moved from the inner parts. You see, his heart was broken for them. It wasn't just a feeling that he had for them. It was that kind of a feeling that must lead to action. He had to take action. Now, one of the things I want you to see about this kind of compassion is, remember, Jesus says they look like a sheep without a shepherd. Don't forget that. Sheep without a shepherd. Now, what do we know about a good shepherd? We go to Psalm 23, and it shows us a little something about a good shepherd. Here's what it says. Psalm 23, the first three verses. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. Don't miss that. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths bringing honor to his name. And so Jesus looks out at these people, these 15,000 people that have gathered. He shows compassion to them, and he sees them like sheep without a shepherd. He knows that shepherds want to provide for and take care of and renew the strength of their sheep, and he leads them by green meadows. And check this out. I just saw this for the first time this week. Mark 6, verse 39, it says, Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups. Where? Green grass. We're talking about this desolate, this kind of dry place. And Jesus leads them and he says, these are sheep without a shepherd. And man, you know what? Have them come and gather and sit in these little patches of green grass. Because I'm about to be a really good, compassionate shepherd to them. You see, this miracle shows Jesus' compassion. Here's the second thing this miracle shows us. It tells us a lot. This miracle shows us Jesus' provision. It shows that Jesus is a providing Jesus, that Jesus is able to provide. Again, in Mark's account, Mark 6, 41 to 43, it says that Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up toward heaven and he blessed them. 
And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. You see, I don't know if you ever heard of this phrase, a zero-sum game. If you ever heard of this phrase, but let me explain it in kind of the best way I know how. If I looked out right now and I showed compassion on all of you and I said, you know, this crowd looks hungry. And so I place an order right now. I call up, you know, Little Caesars. They're hot and ready pizzas, right? And I say, you know, I got a crowd that's hungry here. So would you just send over a, a large pepperoni for us? Now, you guys might be thinking, mm, I think you might be underestimating how hungry we are, right? If you had one large pizza, I could technically feed everyone in this room with it. You just wouldn't get very much. You know, I'd have to slice it into 200 slices, and each of you would get like a little bit of a crumb of pizza. And you'd be like, what was the point? Now I'm hungrier. You put something in my mouth, and it wasn't enough to satisfy. And see, in a zero-sum game, you recognize that there's a limited quantity, and everybody can only take from what's there. And once it's out, it's out. And for a lot of us, we go about this life treating God like he has a limited quantity of blessings. He has a limited amount of energy to hear our prayers. His blessings can only like, oh, listen, I gave you two blessings already. You only got one blessing left this week. Like somehow there's a zero-sum game when it comes to Jesus. But the truth is that Jesus doesn't operate that way. He created everything. And if he runs out of something, he just creates more. It's exactly what he shows us in this. He's got only five loaves of bread. And I did the math. In order to take five loaves of bread and the two fish also, but just think about the bread for a moment. Five loaves of bread in order to feed 15,000 people three slices each. He had to turn the five loaves of bread into 4,000 loaves of bread. You see, there is no zero-sum game with Jesus. He can take what little we have, what little you are offering, whatever he wants to, and he can take it and provide for you. You might be thinking, like, how do I, how do, I don't see Jesus providing. I don't, you know, when it comes to um, Jesus being a good shepherd, you might feel like in certain points of your life that maybe you're in this season right now where you're feeling like, I don't feel like Jesus is providing for me. I've been needing something. I've been asking, and, and God's not really providing. But if you think about the good shepherd from Psalm 23, the good shepherd knows that you need to be in green meadows and that your strength needs to be restored. And sometimes the good shepherd knows that there are seasons where in order to get to the green pasture that he has planned for you, he's got to take you through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes you might be in a season that doesn't feel like God's providing for you, but what he's doing is he's taking you through a valley, he's taking you through difficulty, and he's walking you to a place where on the other side is the blessing that he has planned for you. But at the end of the day, Jesus, his miracle shows that he can provide, that he plans to provide, and he can do that. But here's what I want you to understand about this second point, is most of the time when Jesus performs a miracle, he does it in a really unique way. Let me, let me show you this. In Mark 6, verse 37, if you go back, they're like, listen, feed everybody. And, and, and then they said, you, you do it. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. Think about this for a moment. I would imagine that if the disciples are sitting there and Jesus is here and there's 15,000 people and you got five loaves of bread and two fish and they're like, what, what are we going to do? And Jesus says, you feed them. I would be like, no, you're Jesus. You feed them. I can't feed all these people. You do it. But Jesus so often in the, the, the output of his miracles onto his people, guess what? He uses you and me. He allows us to be part of the miracle that he's performing. He doesn't need us. If I just sit back and say, Jesus, I'm not serving nowhere. I don't want to be a part. I'm not giving nothing. And listen, he's going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish with or without you. But how cool is it that we get to see the disciples got to be part of the miracle? Amen. Jesus tells them, you do it. Jesus is the one who's going to multiply the bread. He's going to perform the miracle, but he's going to use the disciples to do it. That might look like, um, you know, maybe, 
Maybe you've received a miracle in your life recently, and there's just a check that showed up, a bonus at work and something. All of a sudden, you got more money than you were needing at the moment. And you're like, wow, it's a miracle. And you might not even realize it, but when you take that and you say, well, I'm going I'm to try to find some way to bless someone else, and maybe you're, you give a generous gift to someone that's in need, you know what that person is sitting there thinking? It's a miracle. Guess what? God used you to perform a miracle in someone else's life. And it reminds me of a story. There's a guy, and he's got his family, and there's no food left in the pantry, no food left in the refrigerator, and he's sitting there, and he doesn't know how he's going to feed his family their next meal. And so he prays right then. He gets on his knees in the kitchen, and he says, God, would you please provide some food for my family? And as he's praying, his window is open in the kitchen, and his next-door neighbor, their window is open also. And in that house lives an atheist, a guy who doesn't care about Jesus, doesn't love Jesus, and he overhears this, his Christian friend praying for, for, for food. And so he thinks he's got this little sneaky idea. So he goes out to the grocery store, and he buys a whole bunch of food and puts it in boxes and puts it on his neighbor's front porch, and he rings the doorbell and hides behind the bushes. And then the Christian guy, he opens up his door and he sees all the food and immediately he prays, God, thank you so much for hearing my prayer. You performed a miracle. And the neighbor jumps out from behind the bushes and says, ha, it wasn't God, it was me. And so the guy backs up again and he prays, God, thank you so much for performing a miracle and making the devil pay for it. (laughs) See, here's my point, God can use you and long, he used the disciples to go and distribute this miracle to people. And so God, as he provides and he blesses, he invites you to participate in his miracles. He doesn't need you, but he plans to use you to meet needs in other people's lives. And so as that story goes on, Jesus says, you feed them. This is how they respond. They say, with what? They asked. We'd have to work for months. By the way, it's actually about six months of time Half a year's salary that was going to be required to feed this group of people. We'd have to work for months to earn enough food to buy for all these people. How much bread do you have, he asked. Go, out, go and find out. And then they came back and they reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Here's why I bring that up. It's kind of a hard truth that will make some of us uncomfortable. Is that sometimes... In order for Jesus to perform a miracle in our lives when it comes to providing for our needs, he needs us to bring everything to the table. Let me say that again. Sometimes Jesus is requiring and wants and longs for you to bring everything to the table before he's ready to perform a miracle in your life. You see, for a lot of us, we're like, listen, God, I, I, wanna, I want a miracle in my life, but I don't want you to be able to take all the credit. So I'm going to do like 50% of the work. I'm going to need you to do 50% of the work, and we'll get this. I, I got this I'm going to bring. I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to bring that to the table. Could you bring? And Jesus is saying, listen, I just want you to trust me. Bring everything you got to the table and watch what I can do with it. This, this word that maybe you've heard is the word vulnerable. You know, none of us like to be vulnerable because vulnerable is another word for woundable. When you're vulnerable, what it really means is that you're taking your armor off. And what you do when you take your armor off is you're allowing yourself to be woundable by other people. When you go up to a friend and you say, listen, I'm going to be real vulnerable with you right now, you're basically giving them permission to, in a loving and friendly way to wound you. You're giving, giving yourself and you're opening yourself up to criticism or rebuke or accountability or whatever that might be. And, and this little boy... He went, and he, here's what I would have thought if I were the little boy. If someone would have come up to me and said, hey, Jesus wants your five lo- of loaves of bread and your two fish, and he'd be like, listen, I don't know where these 14,999 people didn't bring their own lunch, but I brought mine. My mom packed this for me, and she told me not to swap or share with anybody. And yet, that's not what he does. He decides to be woundable, If this had been a zero-sum game, he would have known, listen, I'm going to give my full lunch over, and then I'm only going to get a little piece of it back because i got to share it with all these people. But he let himself put everything out there and trust God with whatever God was going to do, and everybody walked away fully satisfied. This boy got to eat way more than he brought or wanted to eat. And another thing you're going to notice about this whole thing is, is that when they, remember how many disciples were there that were distributing this bread? There were 12 disciples, 
And they go and they collect all the leftovers. And how many baskets full of bread are left over? Twelve. I love it. Because Jesus, again, is reminding us that he uses us. He's got a plan for you, and he can use you to be a part of the miracle that he's providing. You know, one thing I wish these miracles told us, or these accounts of this miracle told us, I wish we knew what happened with the leftover bread. I would like to know. Here's what I hope happened. I pray that this happened. One day, maybe I'll find out. I hope that little boy got to take all 12 12 basketfuls home. Brought five loaves, two fish. I hope he's going home. Mom, mom, look at all this bread. I don't know what happened. We don't get to find out. But here's the point. We get to learn, number one, about Jesus' compassion through this miracle. And we get to learn about Jesus' provision through this miracle. Here's another thing. What's even better than just providing for someone would be like this, this incredible satisfaction. I could just provide for your needs. But to, to, to go way beyond that and satisfy your needs and go even to the point of leftovers shows us something incredible about Jesus. This miracle shows Jesus' grace. To understand this, you have to understand the definition of the word grace. Grace simply means that Jesus shows unmerited favor. Another way of saying that is Jesus shows you that he's willing to give you good things that you do not deserve, that you did not earn. None of these people work for this bread. Jesus owed them nothing. And then yet out of his grace, he gave them what they did nothing to earn. And what we see here is that Jesus is a gracious God who often, in all, uh, throughout all the stories that we're going to read about Jesus' miracles, he gives us what we don't deserve. It's great. It's incredible truth. In fact, in Mark 6, 42, in the NIV, it says, they all ate and were what? Satisfied. He could have just said, listen, everybody, take a few bites. That should get you through the day. Enough calories, you know, so that you're, you're not losing any calories today. You're not, this isn't going to be a weight loss plan today, but just eat enough. I just want to sustain you. That's not what he did. He gave everybody more than they could eat until they were full and they were satisfied. That word satisfied to me is like the word joy. He gives above and beyond and will give you what you need and what's good for you. You see, Jesus gives the people what they did not earn as a free gift of love. What's incredible too, we see about how this points to a later thing that Jesus is going to do. He takes the bread in this miracle and what does he do? He breaks it. And what is he going to do later in the upper room? He's going to take bread like we did when we took communion, and he's going to break it. You might have broken it in your mouth with your teeth, or maybe you snapped it in two before you ate it. But Jesus takes bread in the upper room, and he reminds people, my body's going to be broken for you. And he points to a future miracle, something he's going to do that's so powerful, one of the most incredible signs and, and symbols of God's grace is where he allowed his body to be broken for you through Jesus. You see, he has endless love for you. He has endless grace for you, mercy for you, kindness for you, provision for you. Here's the fourth thing we're going to wrap up uh, this morning with. Uh, This miracle shows us Jesus' kingdom. One of the things I don't want you to miss is that by looking at this miracle closely, you can actually see that it points to something bigger than just bread in our hungry stomachs. You see, what what we see is that Jesus has something more in mind than just feeding these people. In fact, all of the miracles we're going to look at in this series, they kind of have one big thing in common, and it's this. All the miracles are, are a sneak peek into a more eternal and fuller fulfillment of those miracles in eternity. Like last week, Pastor Michael talked about the miracles of Jesus healing the sick, Right? Jesus was able to go up to someone who is sick and in their natural body say, be healed, and then their natural bodies got better. But guess what happened? Their natural bodies eventually got sick again and they eventually all died. Lazarus, you know, brought back from the dead. Well, he's dead. So, so Jesus, by performing a miracle of bringing health back to someone's life, what he's really doing is saying, listen, one day through the, my death on the cross and through faith in me, I'm going to make all of your bodies no longer need healing ever again. They're going to be perfected. You see, he's pointing to his kingdom. 
Next week, we're going to talk about the miracles of Jesus where he, he has authority over, this, over the natural world. He's able to speak to nature and it obeys his command. He's going to look at a storm next week and say, be still. Sure, there's going to be other storms on the Sea of Galilee. But one day in eternity, all the chaos of this world, all the storms, all the brokenness, all the fighting, all the war, all the everything, Jesus is going to look at it one final time and say, be still. And it's all going to be done. You see, his miracles are just pointing to a, a bigger picture, a long-term eternal fulfillment. And the same is true here. By Jesus feeding people bread out of, out of essentially nothing, he's pointing to something in, in, in eternity. Let me show that to you. See, if you go back to John, where we opened up this morning, John chapter 6, what happens is he feeds the 5,000, and then he finally wants to get some rest again, right? He feeds the 5,000, so this is his plan. The end of the day, everyone's been fed. He knows that if he gets on the boat with the disciples and they go across the lake, what are the people going to do? They're going to follow him around, right? So he puts his disciples in the boat without Jesus, and he says, all right, you guys go. You guys get some rest, and Jesus stays. And then that night, when everyone's asleep, Jesus kind of sneaks away too, and he walks across the lake on the water. And that's what you're going to read between uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and John 6 up to about 25. And let's pick up in verse 25. The people wake up the next morning and they're wondering where Jesus is and it says they found him on the other side of the lake. So Jesus, again, can't get that rest he's looking for. They, they go around the lake, they're looking for him and they finally found him and they say, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you. The only reason you guys are going out of your way to walk all the way around this lake to find me again is yesterday I fed you until you were satisfied and you guys are hoping that today is a repeat that you get your lunch on me again. He says, but not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about the perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. And so what Jesus is saying to the crowd is, listen, you guys came so that your natural need for hunger to be satisfied, you guys came so I could give you earthly bread. But I'm telling you, there's something bigger in store for you in eternity. My kingdom is bigger than just bread for your belly. And the people essentially said, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, tell us more. And he says, listen, what you got to do to get this is you need to believe in me. And the people have the audacity. Remember, Jesus just fed them the day before. They have the audacity to say, well, Jesus, if you want us to believe in you, you're going to have to give us a sign. You're going to have to do something really cool. And then they even go out to say, Moses fed our ancestors with bread from heaven. Boy, are they confused about where that bread came from. And so Jesus corrects them. He says in verse 32 of John 6, instead... Or Jesus says, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from, the hev uh, from heaven and gives life to the world. And the people say, wow, we want some of that bread. This bread from heaven, we would like to taste that. And, and then Jesus goes on in verse 35. Jesus replied, he says, I am the bread of life. This is one of the seven I am statements in John. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This whole concept of Jesus saying, listen, if you eat the bread of life, you will never be hungry again. It points back to an Old Testament scripture I want to show you. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Verse 11, the first part of the verse is this. It says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. And then it says this, for he has planted eternity in the human heart. Let me explain what this verse means. It means that every single one of you in this room, I could go across the room and point at each one of you and say, this is true for you. Every single one of us in this room, God has put this hole inside of you this longing for eternity, 
There's a hole in you that, that you might be trying to fill with other things. We go out, and when we don't know about Jesus, we don't know about how to fulfill this hole in our life, we go out and we try to fill it with so many things. We'll go out there and try alcohol to fill this hole. We'll go out and there and try to find success and money to fill the hole. We'll go out there and try to entertain ourselves. We'll try sex to fill the hole. We'll try drugs to fill the hole. We'll try relationships to fill the hole. We'll go all over trying to figure out how to, this hole that each of us has, there's a longing uh, where, where again, Ecclesiastes said that he has pla planted eternity in all of our hearts. And we're going after, we're chasing after all sorts of things. And then Jesus shows up and says, just like that bread yesterday satisfied your physical hunger, I am the only thing that will fill that hole in your life for eternity. Amen. I am the bread of life. And if you eat from the bread of life, you will never be hungry again. Certainly these people are going to be physically hungry again. He's not talking about physical hunger. He's saying, listen, if you, if you enter into a relationship with me and you start doing things my way and you make me the Lord of your life, I will be the only thing that fits that hole. That eternity, that kingdom that this miracle points to, it's found in Jesus. Listen, maybe you're in this room right now and you've been, you're not really certain about church you're not really certain about Jesus. Maybe you're just here exploring some things and it's because you're longing to find purpose and meaning in your life. You've been trying all sorts of things to fill that hole and none of it seems to be working and you just come here desperate. Well, I want you to know, just like the 15,000 people that showed up to Jesus desperate, that Jesus looks at you and says, I find an opportunity right now to show compassion to you. I see a sheep without a shepherd. And he wants to provide for you bread. He wants to not only meet your physical needs, but he wants to, to fill that hunger that will last for eternity without Jesus. And he walks into this picture and says, listen, just give your life to me. Eat from this bread and you will never be hungry again. So our what now, God, the question that we ask God each, each Sunday where we we pray and say, God, what is it that you want us to do with this? I want to challenge you to think about a couple things. One is that just know kind of a big idea that Jesus is your source of sustenance. He will not only meet your physical needs here on earth, but if you allow him in eternity, he will meet your, your eternal needs. He's your source of sustenance both here and in eternity. But here's the problem. For many of us, we're more excited about what Jesus can do for us physically. We're more excited about the gift that he wants to give us than we are about the giver of the gift. We want what Jesus can give us, not Jesus himself. The way I wrote this is that we want the blessings, but we don't want the blesser. We want the gifts, but not the giver. We want the benefits, but not the benefactor. We want the provision, but not the provider. We want the reward, but not the rewarder. And I'm just telling you, if that's the way you're going about life, you will be hungry again because you're just looking for the blessings that the blesser can provide instead of taking from the bread of life, which is the blesser himself. And so if that's you, listen, the big kind of big picture is that you need the bread of life. You need to eat from the bread of life and you'll never be hungry again. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this reminder as we watch you perform these provision miracles throughout Scripture, that you are a gracious God who gives us what we do not deserve. Whether you're turning water into wine at a wedding or you're feeding a group of 5,000 men and their families or 3,000 men and their families and all these places in Scripture where we read about these incredible examples of you providing for people's physical needs. God, we thank you for the way you provide for us physically. But we know that points to the truth that you long to provide for us more than just a physical provision. You long to be an eternal provision for us, for us to enter into an eternal relationship with you and your kingdom. And so, Father, I pray that every single one of us in this room would enter into that kind of relationship with you, that we'd recognize that you are the bread of life and move forward into eternity, never hungry again. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we
we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.